Okay, let me present you briefly uh, the sound. Most of you uh, have attended yesterday's Kamoku presentation. Today is his original seminar, original talk. His professor at the North Carolina State University. And, uh, have published or uh, publication record includes over 100 papers. Let me just remind you some of the topics, uh, basically, which he started. You know, uh, the idea of considering non abelian uh, young Mills and other theories, but mostly young Mills theories in, Which we in uh, geometry with some compactified dimensions and um, you can, uh, phase transition free path to from this uh, semi compactified manifolds to R4. Uh, basically uh, was uh, open and was developed by Midhat also. Uh, we started this direction. On the way, en route, Midhat found a huge number of various physically interesting quasi-classical uh, solutions, uh, which, are, which extend the class of instantons and monopoles way way beyond what was known previously and using these solutions establish uh, very interesting phenomena uh, even a weak coupling with quasi-classical approximation works for instance uh, spontaneous breaking of some discrete symmetries uh, confinement uh, that, uh, that was a classical, uh, the classical situation, and so on. Based on this, uh, his, I mean, he developed many other new ideas in quantum field theory, what is now sometimes called modern quantum field theory, with a totally new, at least two totally new classes of half anomalies, which involve non vocal order parameters, and in this direction, uh, Metcat was a pioneer. That's all I want to say to introduce him. I think he will present us today. You see, anomaly preserved specifications is something of a combination of these two basic ideas that I have mentioned. Thank you very much for the introduction, Misha. Um, can everyone hear me well? Okay. So today I will be talking about uh, two hoop anomalies and in the context of compactification. And again, uh, a variant of the talk that I have given yesterday. Yesterday, there was no two hoop anomaly, no topological field theory in the game, and just uh, uh, some compactifications and this um, at first I actually adopted myself starting to investigate this program because I thought that what new things can it provide you know and to my surprise uh, uh, to my surprise eventually I realized that there are some basically interesting phen phenomena which actually challenges what we have learned about confinement, uh, chiral symmetry breaking, and other uh, and various things that uh, that came along, okay? So probably the most uh, striking outcome of this study is following. So let's consider a theory, start from here, something like, it can be Yang-Mills theory, for example, or it can be CPN, it doesn't really matter. So 
Usually we say that uh, topological charge is integer quantized. We know this is true. Uh, this is how we uh, separate the partition function. And we also, you know, uh, provided the uh, uh, self-duality bound, so some bound is satisfied. We say that the action is also in units of the instant connection times an integer. So let me tell you what we will get at the out at the very end of my talk. And, and the main thing that we will reach out is actually something which is a refinement of this and which tells us that we really need to construct semi-classics much more carefully, uh, even in, uh, you know, when we consider the theories at large volume. So it turns out that any of the theories I will consider, and this can be done, I think more or less any theory, any gauge theory in four dimension, you can couple it either to a ZN topological quantum field theory. This literally changes nothing locally. Locally, the theory is still the same, but some global properties changes. You can either just turn on some background or you can genuinely gauge this ZN. And then, for example, if you start with SUN theory, you end up with SUN mode ZN theory. Okay. But when you do this, uh, you can see that, let's say you went to the SUN mode ZN theory, the topological charge is quantized in fractional units. And assuming that the fractional uh, configurations are present, uh, assuming that some self-duality equation is satisfied, action is also fractional. But now, if you want to take a step uh, back to the original theory. Sorry, it, what's K? Like K, is K is some integer here, yeah. So if you want to go back to the original theory, of course, in the original theory, if you have SUN, you know that topological charge must be quantized in integer units. There is no doubt about that. But for example, a configuration here, which has topological charge one over N minus one over N, which gives you zero, can have an action which is one over n plus one over n, which is two over n. So I think this is the uh, this is the refinement. In this sense, the action in the uh, in this construction actions can be fractional. I will make this uh, very concrete. First, I will start with a super simple quantum mechanics. Apologies. So many of you for that, but I think it's very illustrative. Consider a particle on a circle with n minima. I took four minima here in the presence of this potential. Okay. Since it is too many words, quantum mechanics of a particle on a circle with n equivalent harmonic minima, I call it TN model for short. Okay. So this system has a ZN translations symmetry, obviously. And if we go to board of time approximation, for example, consider low energy physics, we can reduce this system to the tight binding approximation and study its spectrum. The energy spectrum is given by this lowest end states. And if we now uh, stare at this formula and sketch this, this is the ground state. It has some interesting structure, unique here to top degenerate there, but this is roughly uh, what we obtain. And I will just decode this. Just like a theta is the same. Theta is the theta angle. Yeah. Theta is the theta here is the or two. I consider this particle on a circle, but I put then uh, a Harono bomb once there, which corresponds to the theta angle. Yeah. Uh, but you can think of it as an Harono bomb flux through the center of the ring. If you don't put it there, yeah, this theta and that theta, yeah. Thank and you. K, K is labeling Q. K, K is labeling Q. Q is the position. Q takes uh, Q takes n discrete values here in the low energy. K is in some sense uh, quasi momentum label. It is the discrete Fourier transform of Q. Okay. So, and this is the standard dispersion relation that we get from this system. Thank you. Now, I just want to decode this result uh, just a little bit. 
Now let's consider for the system Euclidean partition, Euclidean path integral. Of course, this is a sum over periodic paths. So, and uh, so I have to sum over uh, paths which are, uh, which obeys this kind of condition. And these paths are of course classified by integers. So I have to think of mappings from the thermal uh, circle uh, to target space. And these are classified by integers. And this is really just the binding number. And in the, in the Euclidean path integral, I am only summing over these integer binding number sectors. Okay? Now, let us, this is just, let us decode our partition function. I just wrote the partition function taking into account n lowest state. So I just wrote cosine, you know, split cosine to two parts, you know, extended it. And now you will see that I inserted, uh, you know, I replaced the sum over K here by using something like Poisson summation with a constraint, which tells me that, which tells me the following, which tells me that little n minus little n bar must be an integer multiple of capital N. What does this tell me? This tells me that I am summing uh, here in this picture, if you go back to this picture. Uh, I, me, me, sorry, it had, I'm, I'm sorry. Midhat, I'm sorry. Uh, in this formula uh, for z, uh, this cosine in the exponent or not uh, on uh, or, or in in the pre exponent in the first line. The exponent. It's in the exponent. In in the exponent, right? Yes. I see. Okay. So, no, I was just not not sure. So it could be. Uh, the, I I was thinking that it could be in pre exponent cosine. No, I see. Just the spectrum, so it is just sum over the Boltzmann weights for the n. No, because okay. No, because the, my impression is that the expansion uh, which is written, uh, it's expansion of cosine are uh, included. It's not expansion of exponent into the power of cosine. Uh, no, actually, I just split the cosine to two exponentials. It is like exponential of the exponential. Then I just expanded it into a Taylor. I see, I see. So, so yeah. it's a double exponential. I see. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So, okay. Uh, go back. Let me tell you what this little n is. Little n. Okay. Okay. So, little n is just an index, but the important thing is. If we just stare at this final formula, actually, if you look to the terms contributing to this sum, indeed, all the terms contributing to the sum are over integer winding. But the terms, uh, you, the terms that appear in the action can have fractional action. Okay? Because, for example, a configuration like you, you, uh, one can tunnel. Oh, ah, this is a nice picture, you know. One can go forward here, one step, and come back, one step. This is a fractional action configuration, but it has winding number zero. This is something very simple, but it will be very useful even in Fury and Mills theory, okay? Now, this is all good. So the main lesson is that indeed, the topology is classified by the integer topological charge, but the action is in fractional units. So now I will make these statements a little bit more formal. So I will talk about coupling uh, this quantum mechanical system to a, a topological theory. And, and this is something, uh, somehow sophisticated for something rather simple, but the virtue of it, however, is that the somehow abstract formalism will carry over verbatim to pure and Niels theory or CPN or some other gauge theories in four dimensions. Okay. So what I will do is that I will start with this TN model and turn on some 
we had a ZM translations metric, and I will just turn on a background related to that translations metric. Okay. Now, let me first tell you what is uh, ZM TQFT here. So, uh, so it is a ZM gauge field here in this particular case is described in terms of a pair of fields, one form and zero form fields. And they obey the relation uh, which is imposed by this F0. F0 is a Lagrange multiplier field. You can just integrate it out. And P is not important at this stage, okay? Just integrate it out and you obtain the relation between A1 and A0, and it's sufficient to describe the uh, ZN gauge field, okay? So this thing has, a, uh, has some uh, gauge invariance. Uh, here, and, and in order to couple this thing to to quantum mechanics, uh, so we declare that our TAT configurations also transform under this. Hence, the gauge invariant combinations are these combinations. Q dot is replaced with Q dot plus A one, uh, and Q and Q is replaced with N Q plus A zero. These are the gauge invariant combinations. If you do this, the partition function becomes this. It looks something somehow complicated, but it's actually something very simple. So I will tell you what this is exactly. So, so since we are dealing with some simple quantum mechanics of a particle within on a circle with n minima, we should tell you know what this quantity, complicated looking quantity, is calculating. So in fact, it is just calculating, uh, as I said, it, uh, the system is a ZN translation symmetry. It is not calculating the trace uh, with just Boltzmann weight. It is calculating a trace with the insertion of a translation operator. Okay, And I will momentarily show this. So, and that means in the path integral, we take a twisted boundary condition for this, uh, for the uh, uh, for the for this field for this field, and now uh, of course this is the uh, we can undo this twisted boundary condition. We can make paths periodic by a field redefinition. So this phi is twisted, but we can make it periodic by this field redefinition. And now if we absorb, if you write down the action in terms of Q as we did originally. Instead of Q dot, we obtain this background. And instead of the potential, it's also modified in this manner. And instead of topological term, usual topological term, we obtain this topological, uh, this modified topological term. Okay. So this is the meaning of coupling of quantum mechanics to, uh, to ZNT QFT. So in practice, what does it mean? So in the quantum mechanical system, we had this nice instant form interpolating between Lagrange. In effect, what we are doing is something very simple. We are just, uh, this was in this Y coordinate, we are just substituting this. You know, we are writing stuff in terms of periodic path, which is the red path and this background. And the sum of these two really makes our usual instant form. And so, so semi-classically, this is the indication that we are actually changing nothing. Instantons are still there uh, the way they are. Uh, strictly speaking, these are fractional instantons here, and so and so. Now, however, now we also have an option of gauging this ZN symmetry completely. If we gauge it, this is the statement that we are uh, identifying edges and sides with each other. So it is like uh, molding the circle with a ZN. You still end up with a circle. And now, if you when you gauge it, of course we have to sum over all possible uh, all possible fields, a zeros and a ones, and you can just translate it and write it in terms of our original theory, ZL was our original theory. And you see that, you know, if you do this, 
if you do this uh, gauging, you end up with just one of the sectors here, uh, one of the bluff space, if you wish, and the Hilbert space on top of that going up, uh, one of those states. So, uh, so gauging in some sense uh, is not changing anything in the local dynamics. It's all the same story. However, uh, we are reducing the dimension of the Hilbert space somehow. Uh, here, instead of n states contributing, just one state is contributing. In this example. Sorry, can you say again how how you select p? Ah, p. I didn't uh, see p. Okay, let me go back. Okay. P actually, I put it first here. Uh, it was uh, it has multiple interpretations. Uh, I I put p up there first. And it can be interpreted either as a term finals term, but in practice for the band, it is really labeling which block state you are taking. It is something um, um, uh, practical in that sense. So physically it's related to the eigenvalue of your temperature? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's you. Oh. Oh. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, this will be it. Okay, ah, okay. This P is also called something called discrete data angle sometimes, but in this context, it's also, you know, labeled P term assignments, but it is really when you are doing this thing, it is like a projection, you know, this Hilbert space. This is in born of Hilbert space in born of Niagara approximation. So you are only taking lowest bands, but in reality, they are all higher bands, infinitely many of them. And uh, when you specify P, you are essentially picking which sector of the Hilbert space you are, you are uh, projecting into. Ah, okay, this is better. Um, okay, so. This is the quantum mechanics that we go to uh, Yang Mills theory. Uh, Yang Mills theory in um, four dimensions is a one form symmetry, ZN one form symmetry. And uh, this one form symmetry is, uh, is associated. Uh, provides a charge that acts on the Wilson line. So Wilson line, so since it's a one-form symmetry, the lines are charged under it instead of point operators. And it is described very in a very similar way to quantum mechanics uh, in terms of a pair of fields. Uh, uh, in this case, a two-form field and one-form field. And uh, these fields obey the condition that the integral of these p2 is 2 pi over n. Now, we can turn on the background associated with this. And the gauge invariant combinations now involves uh, this uh, usual gauge field strength, but we promote it to be a un strength and uh, with some conditions on it. And uh, so this A tilde is the usual gauge field A and uh, this one form part is also contributing. And, and the gauge invariant combination are, is this combination F tilde minus P2. So the, this is nothing but the usual yang mill section F squared plus topological term, but in the presence of this background, it is modified in this manner. Now, um, what does this do? One thing is that it looks like the instanton equation is modified. And if there exist configurations which satisfy, which, such, you know, which satisfy this equation, then you can actually show that, ah, first I should say that topological charge now is not quantized in units of integer, but it, is, it takes fractional values, one over n. And the fractional nature comes along because of this property of the background to form fields. Okay. And um, 
so if there exists configuration which satisfies self duality configuration self duality condition then the action is quantized in fractional units again okay now i want to do something practical with this so and and the, this is the so i want to be able to turn on some two form fields in the old language this is just to hook flux and the motivation is following and i want to understand some properties of the of the gauge theory under this compactification the physical motivation is described in this slide if you compactify a four dimensional any four dimensional gauge theory it doesn't matter which to r2 times t2 and it doesn't matter which way you compactify you always end up with a phase transition okay even in you know qcd edge joint which does not have center symmetry changing phase transition it will still have some partial breaking but that's a detail this is the story because on Two toros, you have two cycles, Polyakov. These are your order parameters, and both of your order parameters become patronic. But when you insert the hook flux, you are actually changing something classical about the theory, not at the quantum level, not at value for anything. It is genuinely changing something in the theory classically. And that changes the story quite dramatically. Actually, I will show you that when you insert the flux, you can go from R4 to arbitrarily small R2 times T2 without any phase transitions. And this is more or less true for uh, any theory that I know. It is and just to hook flux. What does to hook flux mean? It has many definitions, you know. Um, many constructions also. Uh, it has construction from the topology by using bundles. The simplest way that to have constructed them, you know, uh, he, he constructed them in terms of these transition functions. Let's say this is some T2 here, and the boundary condition you set up are such that as you go from this T2 to the next one, you impose a boundary condition in terms of these transition functions, G3. This is the third direction, let's say. And this is the fourth direction. And there is this, uh, again, the other transition function. And the consistency of the field at the corners tells you that this G3 and G4 must obey, uh, must be almost commuting. They do not commute precisely. There is this phase factor, and this is the consistency condition. And this is what to hook it in the case of pure Young Mills. It also applies to many other theories, super Young Mills, QCD joint, Cyber Pitton theory, uh, or an equal force for Young Mills. But actually, to also realize that if we, for example, if we go to QCD with fundamental fermions, we do no longer have one form symmetry, you know, because we have fundamental quarks in the joint. And he points out that it is not possible to turn on uh, this flux in QCD with fundamental. However, I will tell you that there are ways to go around the obstruction. In fact, in the last 10, 15 years, Alexei and I were using lots of tricks on our three process fund and all of those tricks came and paid off here that they apply verbatim. It was a triviality for us to construct some of these things, but this is the original thought. But, and here actually in this, in this thing, the gauge invariant data is actually this N, number N, which is the discrete to flux. Um, okay. Now, when you turn on to hook flux, uh, the gauge invariant combination, the Polyoko group, is not just the holonomy, it also includes the transition function. So it's a non reality. And if you are in the weakly coupled vacuum, you can actually show that the two Polyoko group 
that goes around these two cycles takes two values. One of them is M by N shift matrix. The other one is clock matrix. These are the clock and shift matrices that we know very well from quantum mechanics. And, but immediately we tell you something interesting. You can take these two Polyakov groups as follows. As if you have some yeah, Mills theory and two kinds of adjoint Higgs fields and your adjoint Higgs fields are not commuting with each other. Actually, the only thing they commute, the only thing that clock and shift matrix commute at the same time is identity. So you are actually generating an adjoint Higgs mechanism, but unlike my talk yesterday where we were breaking to maximal abelian subgroup, now it is breaking to ZN subgroup. The phases are still completely fine. So the then the X down is your engage theory to Z engage theory. When we do this, all of the gluons are gapped. And you would naively think that since gluons are gapped, there should not be any confinement, etc. I will tell you the spectrum, interesting things happening in the spectrum. But actually, if you look to the Wilson loop, to all orders in perturbation theory, Wilson loop obeys perimeter law, it doesn't confine. Just like all Polyakov models, to all orders in perturbation theory, you know, we have gapless photons and uh, no linear confinements. So, in some sense, this ZN to all orders in perturbation theory is just uh, usual ZN topological field theory. The real question is, of course, same as on R3 process one what happens non perturbatively? First, uh, let me make this remark because I think it is interesting. Normally, remember again, when we compactify things on R2 times L2 T2, the modes are quantized in units of 2 pi over L. This is the usual Kalsak line decomposition. You can actually work out the spectrum here. Uh, for example, think of gluons. Uh, it's an M by N matrix, but there's tracelessness condition. So there are N squared minus one components. Actually, all of them requires masses, but the masses are much finer. They are in units of two pi over ML. And if you take, even if you keep L fixed and take N large, you see that they become arbitrarily dense. This is an indicator of something called volume independence I mentioned in my previous talk. And this is very intimately related to something called so we start the Gunchkawai reduction in like a field theory. Okay. But let me go in the system at finite 10 to, to the discussion of topology. As I said, if you turn on a two flux, uh, uh, I turn on N34, but for convenience, you can also turn on something like N12. You can immediately show that uh, topological charge is fractionally quantized. And assuming solutions which satisfy the Bogomolny equation exists, and in this case, this turns out to be a non trivial statement. I will tell you why. Actually, the action is quantized in units of the instant connection divided by M. But in this particular case, actually, the analytical, non trivial analytical solution in this construction are not known. There is only one non trivial solution, and it is due to Tuhuft himself. He studied pure Young Mills theory on T4, but the solution is constant through T4. It is not like something like an instant one, it's not a lump. It is constant electric field, constant magnetic field. And in this paper, in his paper, if you look at his paper, there is this funny remark. He is saying something like, the reason I wrote this paper is because it was even very difficult to find this one solution, constant solution, with, you know, action one over n. Well, at least we know that there exists some trivial kind of solutions. But there is 
quite compelling lattice evidence. This is the work of Gonzalez Arayo, Montero, and Margarita Garcia Perez from 90s. They were very interested in the setup and they did many numerical studies of the setup. They actually, at least in my mind, unambiguously show that there are configurations with action one over n. And they even showed somehow BPS property as good as they can show in lattice. They look to the electric part of the action and magnetic part of the action. And when they go towards continuum limit, they can see that it is like 50-50 electric part of the action, magnetic part of the action is almost the same. So why is it difficult to find the solution? And again, the Yang Mills equation to turn on the flux, and uh, it should be a simple nonlinear equation. Yeah, uh, not simple, but it's a nonlinear equation. Um, is that know, right? The equation it, is very it, simple to write it, down. The insertion of the flux, I think, it or uh, the boundary conditions that it has satisfied. That's the boundary condition. Yeah, e either that or either language is fine, but it is. Nobody was able to find these solutions, and it had been 40 years. But, but, you, but you're saying that they should exist. Yeah, they should exist because numerically, you know, the non-trivial solutions uh, exist. So they actually check these uh, configurations, vortices, and they even show that, for example, if they insert a vortex inside the inside the loop. Uh, you know, you can show that the Wilson loop uh, here it acquires a pure phase just in the perturbative vacuum, you know, insert a single vortex there. And, um, but even in quantum mechanical limits, uh, nobody was able to find a solution in this, at least in this context. Uh, if I have time at the end, uh, I will tell you that uh, there is actually a way, but it is somehow subtle uh, to interpret the usual instant monopole instantons. Monopole instantons are exact solutions. They also have, you know, action one over n, topological charge one over n, but uh, they do not arise in this context. They do not arise in the way that to hold implemented to flux. There is a new way of implementing two flux in abelianizing theories. And uh, in, in that case, I believe that the one from instant on, which is an exact solution, can be, can be interpreted as this solution. But in this case, I am talking about vortices or you know this particular SVM broken to, to the N scenario. Yes. Mithat, uh, biology. Uh, about the solutions, are they stable solutions? They, they are stable, yeah. But then same question that was asked, why not to start with some approximate solution and then do iterations? There, there are some works like that, but um, this problem is very difficult. You know, I, I spoke with unbelievably many number of people about this question, you know, I asked everyone. Sometimes people uh, logically assume that they are there. You know, for example, if I ask to the uh, you know string theory community uh, who studied this uh, TQFT coupling to uh, Young Mills, they do not even even bother with the question. They do not even think that the question is there. It must exist, they think. But I asked also mathematicians, uh, and I don't know honestly. Uh, in this part, Arkady, yes, I'm listening. Yeah, 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 no, I'm kind of a bit lo lost. Uh, you talked about coupling to this uh, topological field theory, right, at, at the previous stage. And when when you are talking now, it is still includes this type of coupling, or it's uh, uh, do not referring to this topological uh, uh, part of the theory. <laughs> It is always in two flux background. And for me, two flux is synonymous with some TQFT background. They are the same thing. So the fact that there is a, oh, I don't know. There is a B there in the topological charge to form deal tells me that it's always uh, turning on this background. 
right, right. But so in this way, you know, there you kind of uh, associated this fractional charge uh, um, uh, in appearing with this coupling to topological part, right? Here you are uh, not say um, not mention mention this kind of uh, topological part of the theory, uh, uh, right? It's independent on on, on this previous, right? Or, or I got it wrong? They are tied up. They are tied up. So. If we go, so yeah. here, very early on, oh, it's too, too much to go. For example, here I introduced this P2, uh, and later on I interpreted the P2 as this, uh, you know, in this consistency condition is the phase. Uh, I see. So I turn on some. I see. I see. So, so, so at this point, you were different from Troft analysis of fluxes, right? At this point, right? Because for him, it was just counting all these possible boundary conditions and finding this particular example with Tarons for uh, whatever. Uh, but, but, but here Very it's good. different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Troft uh, looked at these flux sectors. They look. He looked to the. Dualities between electric flux energies, magnetic flux energies. He did some uh -huh. remarkable there, but I am doing something much more practical. I am. I, I see, but I am yeah. built semi classics on his background. In principle, I think he could have done this uh, early on, or many people could have done this. But some, you know, I don't know why it is not done uh, very properly. Mm. Okay. But okay, now, thank you. Uh, sure, sure. Um, I think the person who came closest to doing something along these lines was Mamba, but uh, it was not explicit enough, at least to my case. Um, so since these vortices are uh, finite action configurations, detection one over n of the instanton, that means they proliferate in the vacuum. They have finite density in the vacuum. And I put some manifold here and two, and I inserted this Wilson loop, but be ignorant of the Wilson loop for the moment. Okay. So let us just look to the partition function. So if you look to the partition function, it is something familiar. The partition function is the same thing as I got in quantum mechanics. It is sum over these vortex instantons uh, of kinds. Um, and in the partition function, I sum over all of them. And they, of course, have some position moduli. But the difficult problem of the side moduli of the instanton is no longer here because I used a joint zinc. And uh, everything here is semi classically reliable. So I can sum up, but this is exactly the reverse of what I did in quantum mechanics. In the quantum mechanics, uh, description, I showed this page uh, upside down, literally. So you obtain uh, this kind of structure, and this is actually nothing but the multi branch structure of the Yang Mills theory. Yeah, uh, now I'm, you can. Uh, Midhat, but at this point, look, your expression for Z of theta, uh, where you sum in over K, uh, it is the one which. Uh, in, invariant and that uh, theta goes to uh, theta plus two pi, right? Uh, when you sum over k, uh, when you oh, okay. consider particular e k, it's not invariant uh, under shift by two pi for uh, theta. Are, are not invariant. This is a good point, but there is a constraint in the first expression. It tells me that restrict to integer topological charge, but uh -huh. despite the fact you restrict to the integer topological charge. The quantity that appears in the vacuum energy density, non-perturbative contribution to vacuum energy density, is the fractional instanton. No, no, but this but is, it is for but it is not for the total z of theta. Uh, total z of theta is uh, in this sense is not fractional when you are summing over k. In, in, not fractional in terms of two pi periodicity of theta, right? This one is not two pi periodicity, particularly e k. What is physical? Each each k is a separate vacuum. Or how how to interpret this? Ah, okay, so okay, the ground state. Maybe I have. The slide here. Oh no, the ground state for the ground state. I have to take 
minimum overkey here. These are mm -hmm. the multi branch vacuum structure of the angle. For example, in the interval from minus pi to pi, k equals zero is the, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, k equals zero is the ground state. But if you are in the pi to three pi interval, k equals one is the ground state. I see. I see. And yeah. the others are uh, what is called, sometimes called the N metastable vacua or something like that. The yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for me, it's interesting that in this way you are saying that uh, you are not using uh, total z, which is sum of all k, right? Because if you would you be using the total z, uh, and a log of this z would be uh, different from what you call e k, right? Uh, I think I use total z. This is yeah, not total z. Uh, if you are using yeah. total z, to, the uh, total z uh, has two pi periodicity in theta, and e k does not have uh, e k. Exactly. Each individual term there, if you take uh -huh. theta to each individual term is not invariant. Uh, theta goes theta plus two pi, mm -hmm. but the partition yeah. function. So you have to take uh, k to k. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's correct. What you are saying is correct. But now. Let us insert some Wilson loop here. The only distinction in the story is following. Depending on whether the vortex is inside or outside. If it's outside, you do not bother. But if it is inside, there is an extra phase, which depends on the analogy of the representation of the Wilson loop. Okay? So then you do the sum again. You obtain something. And from there, you can actually deduce the string tension for the Wilson loop in representation R, okay? So, and you obtain this formula and in the volume goes to, yeah, in the volume goes to infinity limit. And, okay. Um, and notice that this formula depends only on the analogy. This is the nice feature of this vortex for example, for an adjoint probe, it is analogy zero. So there is no finite tension, but for something fundamental uh, quark, is a test quark, there is a, there is a finite tension. Ah, okay. Now, let me say what I said very formally. Uh, so I said that tall orders in perturbation theory uh, this construction is described in terms of a Z and TQFT. However, this quantum, uh, this TQFT in two dimension is not robust. And I learned this through the discussions with Alexi, Theo, and Maria, who are in the audience. And the vortex operator that I was adding is actually the thing that they call local topological operators. In two dimensions, they exist. And they used for slightly different purpose. And in my case, I know my microscopic QV theory. And, and then, you know, the proliferation of this, uh, of this local topological operator changes the action. And infrared theory, instead of being uh, ZN TQFT, this part is just ZN TQFT, it is modified by this uh, non topological term uh, by some exponentially small uh, fugacity. And uh, it, at least in, uh, in condensed matter literature, we are often uh, reminded that the gap phases of the matter are classified according to TQFTs. And in this respect, Young Mills is generic theta is represented as a trivially gap phase. And the construction I told you tells you that something more refined exists. So, uh, and the infrared of the Young Mills theory that you obtain in this manner is actually a deformation of TQFT. Um, but uh, Midhat, Midhat, yeah. but uh, uh, but when uh, you are talking about uh, TQFT, a uh, topological theory is the one which has no dynamic. Hamiltonian is zero, right? Uh, so the only dynamics is due to deformation, or, or I'm getting this wrong? Uh, 
plutonium in this case is just this deformation. Exactly. Actually. And if, if you said, uh, that's a nice point. If you, did, if you set this pi to the terms that are allowed by this part, you know, pi has to be some uh, root of you know, two pi over n, then you obtain the spectrum. It's not a surprise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, Hamiltonian is zero. If you don't have it, Hamiltonian is, of course, zero, as you said. Oh. Um, this is the behavior of string tension, how it depends to theta angle. And notice that the, the string tension in this construction becomes zero at theta equal pi. But this is really, um, uh, yeah, on R4, we do not expect this. But this is really uh, the fact that at theta equal pi, actually, this deformed QFT restores back to some Z2 type DQFT. And this is really the remnant. Remember, in the, in the Young Niels theory on R4, it is believed that CP is spontaneously broken at theta equal pi, and there are two aqua. And this is the remnant of that uh, spontaneous breaking of CP in the, in the compactified setup. Now, let me say a few words about the anomaly. Uh, so, of course, in in for in on some four manifold, there is a you know mixed anomaly between one form symmetry and CP. First of all, there is also an anomaly between one form symmetry and theta angle periodicity. If you shift theta by two pi in the presence of this B field, two form field. The partition function is not invariant, but it changes by some case. And for CP at theta equal pi, you know, CP takes theta equal pi to minus pi. But by this, uh, using this identity above, we see that it is not invariant. So it tells us that at theta equal pi, the vacuum cannot be trivial or trivially yet. Um, and the question is, how is this realized upon compactification? And actually, our center vortex theory immediately realizes this. But this is the two form field in four dimension. You can decompose it to two form field in two dimension and one form fields associated with these two cycles and a two hoof flux. Okay. And if you look to you know, the relation between theta angle periodicity and uh, uh, this background field, you see that this uh, anomaly term survives. And this is the virtue of this construction. The fact that this N3 for here is non zero tells you that the mixed anomaly between one form symmetry and CP survives even at the two dimensional quantum field theory. Okay. Now, Okay, this is the last part of my talk. So, um, this, this was the story for pure Yangnius. So, the center vortices in this context generate confinement. At first, it may seem puzzling because, you know, yesterday I told you that monopoly standpoints were causing confinement, and these are genuinely distinct configurations. You know, they have different relations with the Wilson loop. And it's an open question, but both of them are reliable. But now I will tell you a part of the story that really made me fascinated with it. You know, and this is the part uh, related to real QCD, kind of like Ganjian and stuff like that. And here is the story. When we have fundamental quarks, of course, we do not have one form symmetry. Uh, and we cannot gauge it if it is not there. So, hence, we cannot introduce two flux in the presence of fundamental matter. But remember, we have a baryon number symmetry. And baryon number symmetry, U1 vector in QCD, is related to quark number by a factor mod Zn. Actually, this Zn is part of the gauge redundancy. 
a quark by itself is not stage invariant, right? And but n quark together forms a baryon. So quarks in some sense have charge, like if you assume it has charge one over n, you know, baryon has charge one, let's say, in these units. And you can do something interesting. You can turn on a U1 baryon magnetic flux background. Okay. So now in the transition functions, you can use the transition functions related to this uh, to this uh, U1 baryon background. And you can show that, you know, again, the consistency at the corners uh, demands some conditions. And in this way, it is actually possible to introduce to hook flux to this system. So what does it do? So, okay. If you take if you take a constant genuine magnetic flux, this is just U1 magnetic flux. Okay, so if you just take a constant background, we have to look to the Dirac operator in this background and what it does. And I am now considering some QCD with arbitrary number of flavors, NF flavors. You can go ahead and uh, solve for the spectrum and you can show the, solve the Dirac equation and you obtain that there are NF two-dimensional massless fermions, not four-dimensional. Actually, half of the uh, half of them do, do not become zero modes. They are uh, gapped. There are uh, NF two-dimensional massless fermions in this story. Um, but NF massless fermions, uh, you know, can be mapped to you by something called non-evalium modernization, I mentioned yesterday, to UNF uh, level one UNF Vesuminovitan, which is even here. I am talking about QCD, microscopic QCD. And you should realize that the stuff I started to write down here started to look to resemble very much to the chiral Lagrangian. And I didn't say any word about chiral Lagrangian yet. But it's a two dimension. It is in two dimensions, but I will come, I will come to the you wrote these two dimensions quite arbitrary, arbitrarily, right? Because uh, you wrote uh, okay, you wrote, you introduced a plane on the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. And these fermions are attached to this plane, but uh, in 4D we don't have any plane. Exactly, but I will come back to 4D and compactify it to very large T2. And I will tell you what happens. And if you are not surprised, you know, uh, I will buy you something. I don't know, <laughs> okay. but you will be surprised, okay? Actually, this looks like, this part is the usual chiral Lagrangian, but this looks like almost chiral, but it's not quite. You can ask what the center vortex does in this construction. You can show that it actually generates this term, which is again exponential like theta over n and uh, fractional instant on, and is determinant of q tilde. Okay. And this term actually lifts up one of the degrees of freedom. And this will correspond to eta prime, what's called eta prime in QCD. Okay. So IR theory, deep IR theory is a CNF level one, assuming of it, which has central charge and F minus one. Now, didn't I? Okay, let me first, let me go back here first. So in the large end limits, actually we can rewrite this center vortex term in this form. And I said, it is really, the top prime, and we can actually derive the famous Witten Veneziano formula from here. So it also tells me that it must somehow be related to Chiral Lagrangian in a more honest way. Okay. And actually, if one assumes that adiabatic continuity holds, this must somehow match to the Chiral Lagrangian. 
Now, let's go back to Misha's point. Let's go to... No, but, uh, Midhat, but, uh, but your, uh, uh, my, my storm, it's about Ita Prime, it's about this determinant of, of, uh, of you, but uh, your expression <coughs> in other companies of, of you, it looks like Goldstone particle, uh, which may be not um, normal for two dimension, right? Because uh, you know, forget about the determinant. Then it's like massless, uh, massless particle or not? Uh, uh, this, I think, I will answer this question. But let me first describe this, and it will be easier to answer okay. after that. I promise. <laughs> okay. So take very large M four. And then let's compactify it to something like m2 times t2. And let's assume that t2 is still very large. Okay, so what happens? We have to, <coughs> we can still turn on a now in long distances. Let's assume that QCD is described by chiral Lagrangian. And we believe, all of us believe that this is true. And so we must couple this U1 baryon background to the uh, to the chiral Lagrangian, and that coupling is given some this background times some current, and this current is actually baryon current, which can also be uh, called skirmion current, and it is given in this form. Okay, now this is a uh, this term is in uh, five dimensions, uh, whose boundary is, the, is our four dimensional space time, and now look what happens when I turn on this, uh, when I actually, uh, when there is this flux, you, I can integrate over T2 and this thing reduces to a three-dimensional uh, Westminovitan term. Remember, I am still on very large space, but I am considering distances larger than the T2 size. Okay. So this is actually exactly, uh, this exactly reduces to level one Westuminovitan. So this thing U is actually the field of the chiral Lagrangian. And there is a point that was emphasized to me yesterday and the day before by Alexi, which is a very interesting point. You know, when we, in QCD, we say that for the uh, non avalian flavor symmetry, there are two options. One of them is it is broken, hence it is described by chiral Lagrangian. The other is it is unbroken, hence there is a conformal field theory at the end or something like that. The theory may be in the, for example, conformal window, then we may get something like Frank Specs. Uh, the point that Alexi emphasized was following. Actually, chiral Lagrangian secretly this U is really kind of Lagrangian field. It's my pion fields, which was, you know, these gapless degrees of freedom and n square of n square minus one of them. Actually, in itself accommodates a possibility to turn itself to a CFT in this reduction to 2D. That is how it is achieving that. You know, indeed the low energy theory turns to a two-dimensional CFT, but the thing that's very surprising to me, and it was also surprising before, is that you start with the pion fields and, you know, and you assume the symmetry is broken, and then at the very end, you end up with some still conformal field theory. Um, so it is conformal possibility, you know, of course, these two conformal structures are different. And it is, it's an open question to think about that. I think- Can you repeat, because I frankly speaking don't understand. The Sigma model, which you write, if it is assumed that it is not on, in four dimensions, or maybe some dimensions are compactified, but very large. Yeah. Okay, it's a theory of the massless particles, but they do interact. Right. right, so it's not a conformal. But if you calculate right. the Verasoro central charge, right, it's not a conformal. In which sense this theory turns? No, very good. Good question. Now, your space is very large. T two is very large, much larger than strong scale. Okay. Previously, it was smaller than strong scale. Then I regarded it. 
but now go to a distance but uh, r2 is infinite still go to a distance on r2 which is larger than this length scale of the t2 then in that regime the theory reduces to two-dimensional theory effective field theory because despite the fact that it is large you are negligent of that space you know it is it's compact and something okay. like that and then you consider in that regime and then it reduces to you know two-dimensional field theory again and that two-dimensional field theory is again a CFT. okay so you are saying that if on r2 you are going at very large distances the fact that the other dimensions are much larger than right. uh, lambda or inverse right. lambda plays no role because anyway momenta are quantized right. and exactly. you are at larger distances at smaller momentum you don't excite uh, gap mode or exactly. T2, yeah. and then you are back at two dimensions exactly okay. yeah and this, but it's a little bit unphysical well you are you are playing I also that think, bias. Yeah, yeah yeah to begin the with bias yeah. are goldstone particles mm -hmm. and they are not like gluons you and, know? Are, and, and they are and they of and their interaction yeah. is derivative yeah they can yeah. use derivative so if yeah. you go to hugely large distances okay these derivatives become very small right it's my derivatives are momentum. So you go to very small momentum. Of course, pi and that vanishing momentum don't interact. So you may say it's not just conformable, it's a free field theory in this situation. I think it's a, a non trivial uh, the, the theory of you obtain in this construction that the non trivial conformal field theory is just level one less than your return in this. Well, I even would say, okay, maybe, okay, maybe a resolution because, change is something. Because but otherwise, background. remember. Otherwise, yeah. I would say it's a free field theory. No, 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 it is not for sure, right? No, but then the limit moment that goes to zero, all no, 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 but, uh, good, 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 good. Let us actually, good. This is actually, let us compactify without, uh, without, uh, without this uh, U, U1B plus. Chiral Lagrangian compactifies. Okay, let's make T2 relatively small. What happens? Then, if we go to distances larger than this T2 size, it is described by principal chiral model. You know, if you just take the zero mode, zero counter Klein mode of this ion field uh, in, this, in this infinite space, okay, forget about the rest of the mode. It is described by principal chiral model. It's a two dimensional asymptotically free theory uh, the principal chiral model is actually generates a mass gap your ion yeah. will become gaps because of its uh, you know interactions, interactions because of the infrared interactions exactly yeah. the construction tells you that when you add two hook plus and you, when you add this one variable that comes actually uh, you are adding to this um, uh, principal title model this w b w plus okay. and then so it becomes it's all the yeah. modification has to be observed okay so actually i can uh, i can in principle uh, okay finish here by uh, i already made this point but this is sort of a summary so for qcd on large T2 with this baryon number magnetic flux. So you obtain this uh, SUNF uh, level one WZW. And as I said, without this U1B, it is gapped out. And on the small T2, which is smaller than strong scale, with this flux, we obtain something which is described by NF minus one massless Dirac fermions, and it's also by non-abelian bosonization. It's also the same theory, and it looks like there's a perfect uh, continuity between these two regimes. And this morning I got buried, and I thought somehow I didn't have enough slides. And you know, in one hour that I had, I I used some 
And apparently I had enough slides. So I will not describe these parts, uh, but I want to go all the way to my conclusions. Uh, so I only have two conclusions anyways. I think this picture is true. So the, we always, we, I think the expansion parameter, either on R3 cross S1 or R2 times P2, as well as then we reduce to quantum mechanics. But this reduction is not a, it's, it's not a trivial reduction. It's a reduction with a memory. It remembers quantum field theory. Even when we reduce to this proper quantum mechanical setups, the, the non-perturbative effects are always controlled by a instant one divided by n and not by a instant one. So my suspicion is that even if we were to look very carefully to the physics on R4, to the instant on calculus, do it much more carefully, I think that this will also come out to be the correct extension parameter, but this is work in progress. And um, no. no, this one, and this is over. And what that strikes me most one of the things that strike me most is that in two different semi-classical regimes of Daniel's theory, one of them on R2 times P2, the other one on R3 cross S1, we obtain two genuinely different uh, mechanisms of confinement. Both of them are sourced by fractional topological charge, fractional action configuration. But we know these configurations are different because you know, if I look to, you know, from the perspective of the Wilson loop, monopole is sample is trivial, but vortex generates a phase. They have different mutual statistics with the Wilson loop. But somehow there must be a relation between them. And somehow I hope that it will also provide some guidance to us in our uh, attempt to understand uh, QCD and QCD like theories on our course. Yeah, thank you very much. Can I ask yes, a, of course. a sort of general question? This is a very uh, kind of inspiring construction. Thank you very much. But let's say you are allowed to do any experiment in nature which you want to do. Okay, any accelerator, any <laughs> setup, anything you want in your even wildest dreams. Okay. Can I measure some consequences of this construction? Or there's, it seems to me that it's pure theoretical internal, you know, product, which is useful, mm -hmm. but okay, you I understand mean, my yeah. question. I mean, uh, of course, in the in the standard experiments in high energy physics, usually explore the spectrum, right? So, no. Let's assume you can do it. Any... Well, chiral condensates. You know, if you do in this setup, for example, chiral condensates, you get the correct results for NF equal to NC. You get down the Q, get arbitrarily decoupling, but. Do you mean an N equals one super Either N equals one super Mills, you know, I didn't tell you about N equals one super Mills, but N equals NC uh, QCD in this construction. Yeah, it gives the correct kind of condensate, but of course, that's a sort of a numerical excellent because the first beta function coefficient turns out yeah. to be 3n, three. Three right? Yeah. And indeed, this thing is kind of condensate seems to be saturated by exponentially instant on divided by n, which gives you lambda q. Other things are, in general, everything is L dependent. But I want to say that, you know, maybe I should make this point. In retrospect, we did the experiments. You know, we know that, you know, pions have the masses that they have, right? By, uh, one error relations and stuff like that. We, they, we know that their masses, for example, proportional to 
square root of the coordinates. And we know we know some things about those. We did those ex some of those experiments very early on, years and years ago, you know, uh, decades ago. But uh, I would so this is an attempt to understand those kind of questions. Uh, we know MESCAP exists, right? But uh, and we can verify that experimentally. And I think it is those, those kind of questions, uh, fundamental questions. So related to some uh, spectral property of some mesons or something like that, um, I did not think about it sufficiently well to say something uh, reasonably intelligent. But just related to the previous uh, slide, Dave, I mean, you're saying that QCD, so this refined classification, you're saying that QCD has these other uh, fractional instances. Right. Yes, and with no special, just the regular boundary conditions. I'm not putting anything on. Yeah, yeah not anything. putting anything. I am saying, yeah, so I am saying that this. these solutions exist, but no one has found them. If you, yes, exactly. Yeah. But one possibility, it, it, maybe. So if you look to the moduli space of the instanton, uh, these famous. I don't know mathematically what it is, but this ADHM construction. It is, for SUN theory, it is a foreign dimensional space. I am pretty sure that everybody who stared at this a couple times thinks that, oh, this looks like n many quaternionic coordinates. If I declare the four dimensional space time is described in terms of four quaternionic coordinates, it is as if you know, n mini quaternion co coordinates. I think in certain sense, in, in my talk yesterday, uh, I was saying that in the CPM model, there is really a concept of fractionalization without fractionalization. You get a mathematics of things, which looks like as if you're instant on fractionated, but in reality, they don't. Okay, in this, uh, one thing that I have to be very careful about, when do I think that these solutions exist for sure? So then you can actually isolate these solutions. And I think that this, if the entities that enter to this fractionalization without fractionalization, okay, these entities that enter there, emerge themselves. Then you put either these non-trivial holonomy or two flux. Both non-trivial holonomy as well as two of flux actually include the scale. When I put the two of flux, you know, there is size of the torus. When I put non-trivial holonomy, there is size of the circle. And the this thing is somehow like a regulator for uh, for these fractional objects, and their size is controlled by it. If that size goes to infinity, I don't think you will. I don't think you will see them explicitly. You will reduce to this ADHM type of construction of the modulized space, and you will get the story very similar to CP1. But on any space where I do compactification and either put an anterior holonomy or two of flux, I think eventually we will find these solutions. Myself, I didn't work trying to find these solutions, you know, because. Um, I just took to the lattice data, it was compelling enough, and uh, I just wanted to do semi classics with it. And I think it's honestly very hard. Yeah, right. That's your prediction, right? That, that, that kind of could be an answer to Misha's one answer to Misha's question that that's what you predict for QCD, right? Would that be I, true? Okay. No, I disagree. Uh, because well, if okay. you don't <laughs> do all these constructions, you see. If you have R4 from the very beginning, we know this is strongly coupled theory. And I doubt, I don't know, I can make a bet for whatever, that in strong, in this regime, if it's truly strongly coupled theory, quasi-classics won't give you anything. It might give, like for how about, the prime. How about, how about uh, for your discussion of CP1? 
for example, there at theta equal zero. In his book, you know this up, uh, you know. Well, up, uh, two dimensions one. sometimes there may be. There is a IR divergence. Two dimensions we know even exact solutions. It's right, non right. So it's not so surprising that the two dimensions they are much more, you know, in conformal. Let's say group is infinitely dimensional and two dimensions. So. I'm talking about four dimensional strongly coupled theory like Kant means. No, no, but and I I'm to, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's my experience. Prove me otherwise. Prove me otherwise in four dimensional Kant means, not mm -hmm. on the circle. Not the, no, no, if no. you say I do something on the circle at quasi classical regime, and then there is ensure there is no phase transition, you can qualitatively continue. I agree, right, right. but it's not the same as saying that you start from R4, Young Mills theory, even without quarks. Okay. But, yeah. And then you do quasi classics. Uh, and then you say, okay, I can down. find the quantitative solution quasi classic. I totally. Totally but in, in two theory. dimensions, there is a side moduli of the instance. Don't forget about two dimensions. Forget no, no, no. about it. It's, it's, it's not indicative of anything in four dimensions. Okay, then let me go to four dimensions. Okay. Then the side modulus, if it is cut off by a finite correlation length, yes. can we self consistently? No, we know we know approximate very rough, not first principle models of TCP vacuum, a short model, the so-called instant on liquid, which presents a model. It's a reasonable produces a reasonable approximation to a reasonable extent based on instantons, which are quasi classical. But even Shurek never states that it's the full solution. Um, it's, a, it's an approximate model I which think works in a number yeah, of cases of very well with some correlation functions, but don't put to, it's not a general solution. It's not a solution at all. Yeah. Okay, we can discuss this privately. It can continue till infinity with this discussion. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I was a little bit confused though about like the theory mills of the SP2 F8 equals pi. Oh, yeah, very good. So it decompines when you're in this setup. It decompines for the same reason in the comments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But if we want to match that with the R4 expectation. Oh, yeah, yeah. This, it, it, it is a puzzle, actually. But the point is that you obtain two watt law. Yeah. You remember it decompines. So this is actually some artifact of this DQFT. So even it tells you that even if I don't know how to show this, even if you go to a pure young meals on KR2 times DQ, the so theta equal five. Indeed, for physics, the, the T2 can be very large. For physics, lesser than T2 size, the system will be flat and it will have two watt one. Okay, but for physics larger than the size. The, this construction tells you that the theory must flow to a teacher theory. Yeah. Another question I have is that so when you you look at so you set up the T2 with this flux and classically you see that the, the third and fourth direction of plugs and boots have shock uh, clock shift minima. And the argument is that you don't have to look at loop corrections because it's already true at classical level. And plus, uh, that's a very good question, actually. They're stable. So, the, uh, that's a very nice question. Uh, so, indeed, classically, you see that uh, at, at, at small L, uh, you have this classical background of flow and shift. And this question is whether quantum effects, one loop effects, can destabilize this. So there is a very interesting story there. You can always make it stable, but you have to do some things. And, but this question is actually related to something which will look like completely unrelated to this talk. There is some literature, there is some correspondence between theories with full flux 
and something called non commutative field theory via something called Morita equivalence. Okay. And in the, in the non commutative field theory, it is known that, for example, if you take uh, super young yields, there is no instability, but for pure young yields, there is. So there can, in principle, be intermediate phases as you crank up your coupling in which, uh, in which there may be phase transition. But in the larger scale of things, in, in, you know, in some uh, more general phase diagram, it is always adiabatically connected to the other side. Yeah, but I can, I can tell you about this more privately at length. Okay. I don't see any questions. Let's start this